You mentioned uh, they they went after creative people. Could you just elaborate on what exactly uh, is is that a uh, is that what, a profession or is that a mindset? What exactly did, did Apple believe by creative people? Well, I I think it's both. Well, professionally, first and foremost, uh, even during the darkest times, uh, because Apple was the first uh, computer company to offer real typefaces to focus a lot of energy on photography and come up with a, a selection of loadable typefaces that any art director or designer could use to build advertising brochures, uh, whatever, you know, websites, whatever they wanted to build. And uh, the printers and color labs uh, around the world had adopted Macintosh as a standard. So, so it was very difficult in the early days to go from, say, a, a Windows PC to a typesetter or a color laboratory and say, okay, here, here are the adjustments we want to make. Um, there was also this issue of um, uh, calibration, being able to calibrate the screen to have accurate colors. Uh, so you can see what was on the screen is what you would get when you printed out the piece. So I, by creative people, I mean uh, creative. I mean people who are actually working in the profession: the graphic arts, uh, design, uh, advertising, uh, filmmaking. Uh, Macintosh also had some of the earliest tools for creating films, and uh, as early as 1994. You could actually edit a movie on a laptop, which was unheard of in those days. Be able to take large files and uh, move the imagery around as you could with an Avid, which was a, a multi-thousand-dollar uh, piece of equipment, you know, set of computers and hard drives that would take up half a half a room. And suddenly, you could do this on a laptop, and so for directors, filmmakers. This made a huge, huge impact. And I think that uh, Steve said, said basically we, we knocked on business's door for so long and couldn't get in. Let's go back to where we walk. Now you see this phenomenon where more and more uh, Apple products are showing up in business. And it's very rare to find um, a, a pure PC business these days. Most environments are now mixed. Yeah. And, of course, Apple did quite a bit of work to make their products more acceptable to IT, even uh, as from the consumer side, or the, excuse me, the user side, you get a lot of pressure uh, from people who are use, now using Mac products at home uh, to be able to use them at the office and as part of their business life. Yeah, that's actually where the concept of BYOD comes from. The people would say that I'm actually used to this particular platform, which I'm using the other eight hours that I'm awake, so uh, can we just switch over to that? And then there's a general consens consensus in the company that, you know, yes, we all do use this particular uh, software we prefer it. But my, my, like you answered my question, but well, the reason I asked that question is because there's the one aspect that, you know, if, uh, uh, like in our line of work, our designers, they use Macs uh, unanimously, and most designers do use Macs. Most people who are coming up with the presentations and the PDFs and the white papers, for that particular design and the media management perspective, the Mac is used. Otherwise, other platforms are being used. But then there's also this concept that, you know, um, the Harley Davidson, for example, the people writing them are not ne necessarily biker gangers, but they uh, maybe aspire towards it. Maybe they think of themselves as that particular group. So that's why I was asking, is there a a disconnect between people who think they're creative and who are actually creative and then who are using it because if you're talking about utility uh, you can use the Mac maybe creatively to make design but not maybe creatively to create I don't know spreadsheets and Excel sheets uh, not sure if there's any creativity involved but that's where my question was coming from no, I, I, okay I think, I think you make a pretty good point that there is a bit of a, a Harley uh, philosophy that even if I'm not working in the creative department per se, even if I'm not a designer per se, I'd like to feel that I'm kind of hip and cool. Yeah. And uh, you know, Apple had that for a while. Uh, now, one of the dangers of that, and interestingly enough, uh, in uh, 2012, 
well, Samsung exposed this problem with moving from a challenger brand to a leadership brand. Uh, they did a, a commercial where everybody's waiting outside the Apple store to uh, buy the latest version of the iPhone, and it turns out that the, the kids waiting in line, it's actually for their mother and father. That's for their uncool parents. Uh, and basically, Samsung was depositioning Apple as her mother's brand. Yeah. You know, which is not cool at all, of course. And the Samsung Galaxy would be the phone, the, phone, the choice of the new generation, uh, phone for young people who really knew what was going on. Yeah. So there, there's always that, uh, that danger. Now, interestingly, uh, there have been a few brands that become mass insider brands. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, about a decade ago, Nike was depositioned. I forget the brand that did it. I think it was Pony Sneakers. Or it was an, another brand of uh, uh, sports running shoe. Uh, that basically said Nike is the brand that your mother buys. Now, nothing could be less hip than the brand your mother buys. Uh, Nike, through basically celebrity endorsement, uh, but more interestingly, by making these very specialized sneakers uh, for superstars and for athletes, managed to stay inside the cool band somehow. Now, whether Apple will figure that out remains to be seen, you know, whether they'll be able to do that. Uh, and, of course, one of the problems when you have a visionary leader like Steve Jobs who uh, passes away, uh, uh, the loyalists are going to, to be so severely critical of every new thing that Apple does. I mean, just look at the blog, uh, the criticism of Tim Cook. Tim Cook wouldn't have lasted with Steve Jobs if he was not me. It simply wouldn't have happened. Uh, the design staff is pretty much the same. Uh, the advertising crew is pretty much the same as during uh, the high points of, of Apple's uh, uh, flight to the top. But the world will be critical of them, and you have to constantly keep moving. Now, and, and even the investors, I think Apple stock at the moment is very undervalued because um, investment analysts are saying, well, what, what's the next big thing? Where's the genius going to come from now that you no longer have Steve Jobs? Uh, and I think it will come, but it's a difficult transition. And it's very similar to uh, great advertising agencies. I work will be made there for 18 years. And this was a personality-driven uh, culture and company. Uh, it will be in Islamabad or in Pekar or, or in anywhere you, in Tokyo is much more similar than, uh, say, a BDO office in any of those uh, nations because the open culture was so strong and so inculcated through the David Ogilvy's books and his philosophy and his management style, and everybody kind of uh, took the Kool-Aid and picked up on that. Um, it can live on beyond the founder. It will go through ups and downs and cycles, and Ogilvy certainly had a near-death experience right before I got there. Yeah. Uh, but it can, it can come back and go on to be great. So Apple, I believe, has a very, very bright future. They're one of the richest companies in the world. Uh, everybody still wants to work for them. I mean, if you're a, a, a brilliant graduate of Stanford or a brilliant sophomore or junior at Stanford University, it's Google or Apple. You know, very few people are saying, oh, I work for Yahoo <laughs> or AOL. But those brands are still incredibly powerful. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, the Samsung commercial didn't, didn't have the impact it was supposed to. Uh, the sales didn't exactly jump at that same rate. Uh, if you look at, like, I, I'm, I'm very ROI-oriented. I look at Romy more than anything else. Uh, yeah. 
uh, the, you get you make a lot of enemies that way. If you look at the return on marketing, spend a lot. So uh, if if you look at the variation between how much more they spend on advertising as a as a result of which how many how much sales they got, they didn't really do too well. And I believe uh, a lot. Of, you may disagree with this, but I generally don't believe in uh, pushing a brand through negative advertising instead of comparing yourself to a competitor. Instead of Samsung talking about, you know, we're better because Apple is bad. Instead of doing that, they should have just focused on why they actually are different. And that's a whole other debate if if Samsung, ad, if at all, it is actually different than the well, Apple. That, that is a whole other debate. You're, you're correct. And I also believe in ROI as a, a, a fair measure of impact. Yeah. That said, uh, the research I saw uh, said that that... that Negative commercial was more remembered than any of the iPhone commercials from 2012. So you had this one negative ad, uh, and I don't know how much money they spent on it, but uh, it was an attempt to legitimize the Galaxy platform. Yeah. And now, of course, they, they've done the extensions with the watch, and uh, again, Samsung is trying to... Uh, take a page from Apple's book and create an ecosystem of products. Um, and, the, you know, they're in it for the long haul. Now, yeah, one yeah. thing that fascinates me and that, that has uh, also frustrated me hugely is uh, the absence of a global Chinese brand. Uh, obviously, the Chinese love brands. They spend enough money on Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Louis Vuitton and Moet and Chandon and uh, Oakley sunglasses and you know they're, they're obsessed with brands and uh, you know when they travel uh, if you go to the, the uh, Chanel store in Paris or uh, the Hermes store it's full of Chinese people who are on the road business people or tourists uh, Japan took 10 years from the end of World War II to come up with world-class brands. Sony, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, uh, Toyota, for that matter. Korea took about 10, 10 years from the end of the Korean War to come up with LG, Samsung, you know. And uh, they adopted uh, Western marketing techniques and created uh, legendary brands that, that remain strong today. Uh, I think Samsung, most particularly, although LG tried to play catch up with them, and these are the chai bowls, you know. And Hyundai, I, I remember uh, 15 years ago, they ran a commercial in the United States which uh, said, Hyundai redefines the luxury car. And it was risible, it was laughable, it was a joke. And now with the uh, the Genesis, Hyundai has indeed redefined the luxury car, and you kind of have to take them uh, very seriously. They are fast followers, maybe not innovative, uh, but you can get a Lexus-style experience for about $15,000, $20,000 less than a Lexus. Um, okay. okay, where are the Chinese brands? Lenovo made this huge play. Uh, they they changed their name, they blocked IBM's PC division and the ThinkPad brand, uh, uh, and yet their awareness in the U.S. remains below, their unaided awareness in the U.S. remains below 5%. Why is that? Hire is sold all over the world. Uh, it's a huge white goods brand of uh, washing machines, dryers, refrigerators, dish, dishwashers, all of these products. And their marketing strategy seems to be buy a building somewhere between the international airport and the city center and then put your name on top of it in really big letters. That's the branding. Uh, Qingdao is probably the, the most recognized uh, Chinese brand uh, because they're in restaurants. And if you think of uh, what's a good Chinese beer, Qingdao, okay. But where are the Chinese brands? Brands. And what will it take? Are the Chinese just too practical uh, to ever invest in the value side of the equation? Always want to be Foxconn providing 
high quality, low cost manufacturing, or do they want to get on the value side of the equation, which is branding? Maybe it's the perception. It's it's possible people believe that made in China should always mean, well, at least the market for now, not just in China, but maybe outside of China as well. The market believes that China is just a manufacturer. It's not because it's probably so ingrained in people's minds that this is a manufacturing country. They're not a brand company uh, or a country for that matter. So maybe you don't, there's no association between the idea of luxury. For example, uh, if you talk about uh, luxury chocolates, people will say Switzerland. But if you say luxury man, uh, sorry, chocolate manufacturer, people say Brazil. So it's probably that disconnect where people don't create the brand association in their minds between the idea of China being a brand, uh, uh, brand generating company as opposed to a brand manufacturing company. Maybe that's the disconnect that they find, or maybe they don't believe. Maybe that's it. On the other hand, there are, of course, there's this emerging generation of entrepreneurs in China, and um, I think they understand stands that Apple makes more money than Foxconn. And they kind of get that there's value on the brand side of the equation. So I, I think one day there will be uh, you know, somebody from China who learns branding, who figures it out, uh, and then we'll see, you know, because they're very interested in uh, getting into the uh, automotive business. And they're Several manufacturers, are, there's also, you know, BYD uh, that has battery technology unlike anything in the West. You know, they, they have wonderful uh, lithium technology uh, to create electric cars. But they call it, you know, the, the, the brand is Cherry. Okay, well, I, I guess I could say that the Dotson had the Bluebird and the Fair Lady and all these other bizarre brands from the 60s, I think they'll get it eventually. What's interesting to me, though, is that the first experience the Chinese had with big brands was when they created the Shanghai Auto Group back in the uh, early 80s and made an arrangement with General Motors, a partnership with General Motors, and they picked the... Uh, Buick as the brand that they wanted to have in China, uh, manufactured in China uh, by a Chinese company. And uh, I actually know the, the marketeer who was most responsible for that success. Her name is Shirley Young. It, it's a very funny story. Uh, but she said a year before they launched their first car in China, she brought all of them to New York City and spent a week at McCann Erickson and research companies and other places talking about branding. And the managers, very practical, said, we're over a year away from rolling our first car off the assembly line. Why should we worry about this? And because Shirley Young is Chinese, she was able to say, this is important. This is vital to the success success of this company. And uh, they went back to China, went back to Shanghai, be, be true believers, and Buick has been the number one selling car in China ever since that time. Buick, when every other manufacturer, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Renault, Fiat, uh, Toyota, Nissan, every other manufacturer in the world wanted the China market. And I think Volkswagen is number two because they made some very really? special... Yeah, VW is number two. Uh, and, of course, there's a certain residual hostility with the Japanese. Uh, but anyway, that's that's uh, my fond wish is, is that uh, we'll have a great Chinese brand, maybe a technology brand like Huawei, yeah. uh, because China can go places and do things that a European, Asian... European, Japanese, or American brand cannot do. Especially and, in Africa, and, and, and why, why do you think that is? Well, I, I think uh, they don't have the same uh, heritage of imperialism. Uh, they don't have this, the uh, unpleasant history that some of these other uh, national brands happen to have. Uh, and uh, I think they could do... You know, if they want to be do a little bit of good for the world, uh, uh, you know, I got my first thought when Negroponte came up with this uh, 
you know, one child, one computer program uh, to make a hundred dollar durable yeah. laptop yeah. for the thir third world, uh, the first thing that came to mind was, well, China could do that in a more credible way than uh, Dell or, you know, or uh, Philips or anybody else. You know, so anyway, that's, that's it's just a, a personal hobby course of mine that uh, China should have a great brand at some point in time. <laughs> yeah, well, eventually they, they've uh, given Facebook a hard time, mostly because the ban. Facebook and Google are more or less banned in that part of the world, unless you go to Hong Kong. It's a whole other story. But they have built their own brands from the tech side. But if you, I mean, again, I, I'm probably going to be eating my own words in a few years. But uh, I don't see a luxury national luxury brand coming out of there for at least a while, mostly because uh, as the middle class rises, they'll want to adapt the Western brands that they've you know grown up watching and admiring and wanting. Uh, they'll probably consume that in the first generation, but down the road, possibly, they'll have this notion of moving towards national brands or consuming locally produced, uh, you know, businesses uh, and their products and services. So, anyway, I, I, I just... Uh, and, and, Robert, you can already see that happening with consumption patterns among the, the emerging middle class, the emerging wealthy class. Uh, they've actually driven up prices of wine because the consumption of French French wines in China has just shot up so dramatically. Uh, Beaujolais, especially, you know, the new growth Beaujolais and all that, and Champagne and one thing and another. And it's not a wine drinking culture. You know, it's, it's just bizarre. It's got to all be for style. Uh, but, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious that, you know, it could be, you know, like the Japanese retail, uh, Uniqlo, or, you know, maybe, maybe it's going to come from an unexpected direction rather than technology or, or hard goods like cars and cameras and, you know, uh, technology like that. Maybe it'll be from a completely unexpected direction, you know, kind of a fashion, because Chinese art, by the way, has uh, just taken off in a, in a very dramatic way globally. You know, there are uh, Chinese artists who uh, were basically selling in street markets uh, a decade ago and now are in galleries in Paris and Berlin and New York. <laughs> it's quite remarkable. Yeah, I read, I read quite a bit about that on uh, in the Times. Uh, they are saying that uh, their uh, ability to create what is being Today, uh, when someone tries to create, create art, they will they will make it by hand, but then they scan it and they add a little bit of digital touch to it, and then they print it out again and say that this is art. Uh, down the road, the uh, curators can tell the difference. They can see something that's purely handmade and see something that's purely uh, well photoshopped, for lack of a better word. Digitally enhanced. Yes. Yeah, digitally enhanced. Uh, so that's actually one of the things uh, you know. You know, uh, I. I you know, I've read about this. I've been to Athens. I've seen paintings where if you're standing very close to the painting, you see something else. But if you stand far away from it, you see a whole other story. So that's the sort of, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say a heritage aspect that the Chinese apply when they do their block printing and when they need their, uh, what they call the fabric printing, uh, when they do the, their art. Yeah, that's actually pretty much growing. I'm not sure. I didn't know about New York, but I, I know in Paris and uh, most parts of Europe, it's taken off quite a bit. But, uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Steve. But uh, I just wanted to uh, get your um, kind of insight into, just to sort of wrap this up, the, uh, the discussion has gone on really long and really appreciate it. just want to get your insight a bit into, you know, uh, the world is moving towards experience-based economies. I wanted to get an idea, since you've got way more experience than I do, was this always the case? Uh, was this idea of generating an experience for the consumer uh, before the digital uh, generation exploded, was this something that was prolific? Well, yes, and uh, you know, but I think that the sea change. Um, well, uh, let me let me start with the beginning. In the early part of the 20th century, uh, we found that we were through the magic of the assembly line and uh, uh, high volume manufacturing. Uh, we were able to create more high-quality products than people could consume. So it was cheaper to buy a shirt at a store than it was 
to spend the hours required and the skill required to make a shirt at home. So manufacturing uh, uh, transformed the world. I mean, and it actually goes back as far as the 18th century. I think uh, the manufacturer of China, uh, tableware uh, in England, was you know one of, one of the first breakthroughs in the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution ran from the 18th century all the way through the 20th century, and we were able to make a lot of stuff very cheaply. Uh, that's where brands became essential to say, okay, this one is better than that one. This one is more suited to you than that one. If you're a certain kind of person, you want this shirt uh, or that shirt or this car or that car. So there was a proliferation of brands and uh, relatively cheap goods. And experience has always been a huge part of that. And, and it's, it's funny, in the U.S., uh, if you talk to older people, uh, you'll find that, that there were Ford families and Chevrolet families. Now, now maybe there are Mercedes families and BMW families, uh, as those American brands uh, kind of fell off in reputation and quality in one thing or another, although they're coming back. Uh, so I think experience is always a part of this pre-digital, you know, pre the digital age by a long shot. Uh, and to go back to what I said in the beginning, I'm concerned that uh, tricks and tactics tend to be the focus of digital efforts. In other words, what can we do to get attention for a moment, just for a moment, a rest yeah. of attention, do a fun YouTube video, do a, rather than looking at the overall uh, health of the brand, the overall structure and saying, okay, what is of long-term value in this? And that's why, you know, Apple's idea of integration and integrated experiences uh, kind of began at the, at the very beginning. I mean, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak didn't know what people would do with their products. They put color into the Apple II at a time when no computer had color capability. No computer in the world was able yeah. to do color because it wasn't yeah. practical. But they said, you know, we will build uh, the cars and others will build the roads. You know, we'll figure it out this way. And, and who knows what people will do with the creative devices we've invented. And they looked at it in a, in a very, very creative way. So I, I hope I'm answering the question. Uh, I think we've got to kind of stick with branding, get back to it, even as you enter an era where it's possible to have highly customizable uh, clothing, uh, computers, cars, to adapt it to your needs in uh, ways that were not possible in the past. You know, whether I, I love the idea of 3D printers and the, and the uh, cratering prices of 3D printers because, who you know, talk about art, you know, make jewelry or make whatever it is you want to make. Uh, you're providing more tools for creativity to individuals. Now, if you're going to make a business out of that, it still helps to have a frame of reference, a point of view. A Manolo Blanc shoe is not the same as a shoe from Bass. You know, it's a special thing, and there, there's design talent that goes into that. But empowering designers, empowering creative people, I think it will remain uh, centrally important to the future. And understanding how you, I mean, my gosh, if you think about all of, all of the brands of chocolate in the world, you mentioned, you mentioned Switzerland and Brazil, a lot of different kinds of chocolate. Uh, but what distinguishes uh, Hershey's from Toblerone? No. Well, yes, there's shape, but Hershey makes all kinds of different products. Uh, I still think there's going to be a, a huge value in brands. And if we lose sight of that and just focus on, uh, okay, what's the gimmick of the week? You know, uh, can we do some funny cat videos of yeah. uh, you know cats climbing into the bathtub mm. without relating it to some larger brand story? Yeah. Uh, and we're kind of wasting money. Might have a lot of fun, but it's it's not serving the ultimate purpose of success in the market. Yeah.
Well, you know, uh, so the sort of work uh, our our parent company does. It's when we work on digital, at least, it's more around along the lines of get, minimizing the time between a customer's been aware of a product to the point that they can purchase it. And it's not, you know, there there's hurried. I I, I can I can shove the product in a person's face, but it's mostly about, for example, we have worked with IKEA, so. The approach would be, you know, we've created awareness. Now we can show you the sort of options within your own home. If you would take a picture of your home using our one of our applications, it would give you an idea where you can place your furniture, what kind of furniture, and based on that, people can do their planning before they even leave the house. Because uh, what happens in most situations, a person will do sort of a second, a guess in their own head. Okay, this is my room. It's this this feet by this width, and I guess I guess maybe the bed will fit, and they'll go out shop. They'll come back and turns out they bought an oversized bed or an oversized closet or, or something or the other along these lines. Uh, this happens quite often. So that's sort of uh, sort of connects that I find utility perspective uh, in, uh, approaches towards digital that we're at least trying to apply. Uh, but we've gone into uh, creating experiences more than anything else now. Uh, our enterprise and our applications are being uh, – we're trying to create a merger where it's basically uh, – as as a manager on the brand side and as an agency person on the looking after overseeing the brands, you can look after pretty much all the campaigns side by side. So there's cohesion between what's happening on your retail and what's happening online. It happens quite often, like you're saying, uh, uh, one-off shots, one-off gimmicks. So a person will see a campaign on YouTube that says, you know, um, if you participate in this campaign, you will get 10% off. Maybe that person wants to avail the 10% off off on, offline. Maybe he wants to go down to Macy's and avail that, and the Macy's representative have, has no idea what's going on. He's, he thinks he's bluffing. Uh, he's thinking that uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm being I'm being conned here. So that's the sort of sort of work that we're trying to get into. Where we're saying to you, you need to have everyone on the same page. Everyone's the marketer now. Uh, if you're going to have a campaign online, must be meshed with o offline and actually augment the experience a bit more. You can take it to a whole other level. So this sort of uh, approach that we're applying, I find it very a very strange. Uh, but it's a little believable about the kittens thing. Uh, it's not uncommon with our clients even that they've attempted something and they'll come to us and say, uh, we want a viral video. But you have to explain to them there's something, there's, there's this thing called video, then there's something called a viral video. You can't make a viral video. You can spend a lot of money on the video, but that's not, you don't want to do it that way. You want it organic. So yeah, I, I get what you're saying. But, uh, it's, it's like uh, coming in and saying, I would like you to write a, a hit song. I want the most popular song on the radio by next week. Uh, yeah. So how does that happen? Yeah, exactly. So th this is actually one of those things uh, the CMOs are, are hopefully getting a hang of. Uh, like a couple of years ago, when when we used to pitch, it it was one of those things where they said, you know, I, I read this I read this buzzword on Ad Age. I think I want it, just because you know I want to be ahead of everyone. But they don't know what right. goes into it. They don't know. Uh, some things are just organic. You you'll see more hits on a YouTube page of an ordinary person than a brand. You'll see more subscribers in that in that case on a YouTube page of a of a blogger or vlogger than a brand. Uh, there are people who are reviewing uh, cosmetics products online. They have more subscribers or views or likes per day than a brand could ever manage in a month. So it's basically that divide between trying to push your brand or push the utility aspect of your brand. 